Anyway, so my name is Elisa Lynch, and I have been the Chief of Interpretation at Manzanar National Historic Site uh, since September 9th, 2001, um, which was a very interesting time to come to Manzanar. Um, and so I actually was supposed to speak here in September 2012 and had it all set up. And that week, um, we had a death in the family, and so I had to stand you guys up. So I, I was recommended, but I was supposed to be here, um, as usual, late. So I'm six years late, but I'm thankful for the recent recommendation. Um, I was in this building before for Martha Schoff's uh, memorial reception. How many of you knew Martha? Okay. Um, I have a little advertisement. Since he got to do his advertisement, I, I won't take as long, but... Um, if you, you like to use the internet, we can send you a link to this, but um, there's something called the Dent Show, D-E-N-S-H-O, Digital Repository. And it is an online archive of Japanese American history. And uh, many of you, if you know Martha, you know she taught at Manzanar during World War II. And she kept all kinds of photographs and papers and other stuff. And she donated all of those to the National Park Service. And so we have had all of them digitized. Um, she actually has some original Ansel Adams photos in her collection, uh, but we digitized all of them and they are now on the web. So every one of you can look through Martha's photo albums of Manzanar. Um, and I think if you do a Google search, just like Martha Schof DDR, which stands for Densho Digital Repository, um, you should be able to find that. And if not, they'll know how, Andrew has my contact information. Um, so that's my Martha advertisement. I also have to say, uh, being a history nerd, it's so rewarding to be in this old building with a bunch of other history nerds. And I know you're history nerds because I, when I used the restroom, it said, you are in a historic building and we have historic plumbing. And I'm like, who else but a historic society uh, <laughs> would say that? So um, anyway, it is a tremendous honor to be here. I have to tell you, I'm a little bit drunk tired because I just got back from Los Angeles. Um, and this yesterday was the 76th anniversary of President Roosevelt um, signing Executive Order 9066, which is what led to the exclusion of uh, Japanese Americans and resident Japanese aliens from the West Coast. So I was down there for something called the Day of Remembrance um, and met with actually a number of the people who are gonna be in the slideshow. They're a little older now, um, and so am I. Um, but I, I really was uh, just down there with the community and in the places where it happened, which was pretty amazing. The keynote speaker at this event at the Japanese American National Museum was a guy named Alan Nishio. And he was born in Manzanar on August 9th, uh, 1945, the day um, of the bombing of Nagasaki. So it's really interesting to be here with all of you interested in history. And obviously, you have lived your own history, but I just spent uh, a lot of time down there with people who are part of the history here. And, and they all wore me out because I can't keep up with all my 95-year-old friends. Um, so I have worked for the Park Service um, almost 29 years and actually worked at Independence Hall um, near the jail where your relative was. Um, and it's really an honor to work for an organization that preserves American history um, and many of the sites, over 400 sites, um, there's more National Park Service sites that are historic sites or that talk about history than all the big national parks I think that we often think of like Grand Canyon and Grand Teton and all, I mean, Yellowstone and Yosemite. Those places, of course, also have history, um, but uh, there's a lot of historic sites in the National Park Service. And of course, Manzanar is one of them. Um, so this, this is actually the slideshow that I did uh, at the Eastern Sierra History Conference in October. Um, and so it's uh, not, I, I, had, I didn't tailor it for tonight, so uh, Liz and I can both be surprised on what slides I showed back in October. Um, but how many of you have been to Manzanar? All right, that's great. Uh, any, anybody been there in the last three years or so? Okay, good. Well, you're not too far away. Um, this is the cemetery monument at Manzanar. There, are, there were over 100, well, there were 150 people who died in Manzanar. Um, six of them are still buried in this cemetery. Three older men and three babies and potentially another baby in an unmarked grave. Um, but so there are still people who were in Manzanar who never left. 
Um, so, Manzanar, of course, is part of American history. You know, sometimes I think we get in the habit of thinking like this is African American History Month now. Well, every month is African American History Month, and every month is Japanese American History Month, and Native American. I mean, it's history never happened in a vacuum, as you know. I mean, it's great to talk to fellow historians, you know, who understand that it's not. It, all history is American history. Um, this is actually a photograph of uh, the Block 7 High School. And so some of the people in the slideshow tonight were actually people who went to high school in Manzanar. They're in their 90s now. But to me, they're always the high school kids. Um, but I just love this photo because it's, of course, Mount Williamson and then the, um, the flag. Um, being here in a Navy town, I probably don't have to tell you uh, what, what this is about. Uh, just an aside, I have a really dear friend named Joe Hubka, and Joe was born September 11th, 1920. Um, he lives in assisted living in uh, Bellingham, Washington, and he is a Pearl Harbor survivor. Uh, he was on Hickam Field, and I used to work at Mount Rainier before I moved to Manzanar, and when I got the job at Manzanar, and I, I really, really was interested in Manzanar for many years before I ever worked there, and I thought, okay, so I have this job, and I'm gonna move away from Mount Rainier, but how do I tell Joe? Because he's a Pearl Harbor survivor, like what's he gonna think of this? And he told me, he said, you know, I think that's great. I think it's great that we have that historic site. I think it's great that people understand because those were not the Japanese we were fighting and actually, and these are his words, we weren't even fighting the Japanese people. It's governments that fight. And so he was always a big supporter of seeing the development of Manzanar and knowing that those stories were told and in fact, he was gonna be in our color guard for the grand opening in 2004. Um, and then his wife came down with terminal cancer and he wasn't able to leave her uh, for that amount of time. And he also wasn't sure if he could still fit in his Navy suit, or excuse me, his Air Corps, his Army Air Corps suit, um, but he was career. Uh, so, you know, of course, a lot of people think the history starts with Pearl Harbor when in fact, the, there, there's a whole history of, um, of anti-Asian sentiment, you know, first against the Chinese, and we had the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882, get rid of the Chinese, and then we say, well, you know, we kind of like the Japanese a little bit better until they start coming over in greater numbers, and then we don't like them either. Um, I could do a whole program on just the timelines of history and all of that, but that's not this program. Um, so there was, you know, Manzanar's history does not start with December 7th, and of course the history of the site itself doesn't start December 7th, um, but this is often what people think of as being kind of the, the spark that ignited the keg. Um, and just some photos, of course, of Pearl Harbor. I had um, a really distinct honor in the summer of 2007 and part of 2008. I actually went and lived on Pearl Harbor on what's called a detail with the National Park Service. They asked me to come over and help write and research and design the new Pearl Harbor exhibit. And so I actually lived on Hickam Field um, and it was an amazing learning experience. And it, um, you know, because it's a different part of the history. Like I, I focus on, you know, I live at Manzanar, I don't live at, but I live near Manzanar and that's my job. But to look at the, the history of Pearl Harbor um, and actually it was very interesting to me because you, you can probably imagine there's some controversy over the years about the Japanese tourists who come to Pearl Harbor and some level of resentment on part of some people who say, you know, why do they come here? Are they gloating? You know, why do they want to come and see this? And a Japanese American soldier said to a group of us who were planning the exhibit, he said, you know, you need to have compassion on those Japanese tourists because most of them have never heard this story as we tell it here. You know, they don't, it's just, it's presented very differently. And, and so I thought um, a few months later, I visited Japan on vacation and I went to Hiroshima. And I thought that myself, you know, as I asked directions from elderly people trying to figure out how to get where I was supposed to go. And the kindness that was shown to me and the compassion that was shown to me, it was a weird, I had a different, uh, different understanding of what it must be like to visit Pearl Harbor as an American visiting uh, Hiroshima. In case you don't notice, I talk too much and I will be here till four in the morning if I talk this much, so let me move ahead. So this is um, the, a poster that started popping up in neighborhoods um, 76 years ago. 
Now, if you've studied, if you ever look at Executive Order 9066, which FDR signed 76 years ago, um, that executive order gives the Army the authority to remove, quote, any and all persons from designated areas. It does not say Japanese, but it was applied only across the board to every one of Japanese ancestry. It was select Germans, select Italians, and every one of Japanese ancestry. Um, so the posters, you know, there were no posters in Italian or German neighborhoods that said instructions to all Germans. Because of course, if you took out everyone in the country who had some German or Italian ancestry, you wouldn't have anybody, or you wouldn't have too many people left. Um, and of course, you look at who's leading the war effort, like General Eisenhower. You know, you don't get more, uh, more German name than Eisenhower. And in fact, it was General Dwight Eisenhower's brother, Milton, who was the first director of the War Relocation Authority, uh, which is the organization that was set up to remove people of Japanese ancestry from their communities. But anyway, so this poster, you can see a lot of historic photos of these literally popping up in neighborhoods. And you're told to go register and then to show up about a week later. This one is San Francisco. So it's the Japanese Union Church in San Francisco. And you can take what you can carry. And that's it. Um, this is actually another photo from the Bay Area. Um, at that time, it was taken by Dorothea Lang, uh, who did a lot of photography. Uh, some of her photos were not very well received because they felt like they were a little too sympathetic um, to the people. But this is a store owner uh, from the Wanto Company who put up a sign that said, I'm an American. Um, it didn't stop them from having to go to camp, but they were making a statement. And I think, you know, throughout history, there are times that you see people saying, wait a second, I'm American. You know, I personally am a quarter German. I don't know, I'm not a Nazi, but you know, um, my grandfathers were both half German, but it's, a, it's, I think there was a different standard as far as who people were seeing as Americans. So these are the 10 camps that were set up that held Japanese Americans. And the numbers are their peak populations on a single day. Um, this area over here, is uh, the dark area was the military exclusion zone. And um, that's where most people of Japanese ancestry lived uh, in the exclusion zone because they most, came, most people came to the West Coast and were based in you know, Seattle and San Francisco and Los Angeles and the Central Valley. But when the army draws the line, originally they said to people of Japanese ancestry, we don't want you on the coast. So if you move east of Highway 99 in California, you won't have to go to camp. So there are some people who got a double whammy because they sold their farm equipment, they, they moved east of 99, and there was so much agitation in California to get them out of the state completely that then they moved the line to the California state line and everybody had to go to camp anyway. But there are places like in Arizona where they put up the posters and it was, uh, I think it was Grant, either Grant or Grand Avenue. And if you lived on the south side of the street, you had to go to camp. If you lived on the north, you didn't because they have to draw the line somewhere. So you can see there was a lot of foresight um, in, in how it, that's sarcasm, um, and how it actually was implemented. Um, this is one uh, photo, I think it was in Los Angeles. Uh, it says, closing, we won't take it to the Owens Valley for you. And of course, you know, if you were told, any of us here, if we were told you gotta be gone in a week, and the people that you're leaving, the community you're leaving, know you're gonna be gone. Why should they pay you money for your stuff or pay you much money for your stuff because you're not gonna be there in a week anyway? Um, there are stories in, in um, like, there's a book called Kyo Stories of a woman who grew up near Sacramento. And she talks about her, her family on the day that they were reporting to get on the train, they drove their farm truck to the train station out in Florin um, and they just left the keys in the ignition because it's like, well, we're going away. What are we going to do? We can't keep it. And they saw a Caucasian get in their truck and drive it away, and they never saw it again. Um, so there's all kinds of stories like that. And of course, history is just a bunch of stories, right? Um, am I talking too much? I think Andrew told me I'm getting paid by the word, right? Okay. 
Um, this is uh, a train going, so you can see a lot of people have these giant bundles. You know, that's in the days before rolling luggage. Well, yep, take what you can carry. Um, and, and the, you know, there are people who like had kids and they needed to take diapers and stuff like that. And some, there's some oral history interviews where people say, you know, all I did was take diapers and things for my baby. I didn't take stuff for myself. And oftentimes when people were being sent away, they didn't even know where they were going. Um, you could end up in a swamp in Arkansas. You could end up at Gila River, Arizona or Poston where it's over 120 degrees, or you could be sent to Heart Mountain, Wyoming where it was under zero. Um, so it's kind of hard to pack when you don't know where you're going or for how long you'll be there. This is a photograph of the Lone Pine train depot and uh, people arriving. You know, when Manzanar first opened, it was called the Owens Valley Reception Center. Um, and it wasn't, it wasn't renamed Manzanar War Relocation Center until June. So the first few months they were going to the welcoming sounding Owens Valley Reception Center. Um, and if you ever go up to Lone Pine, that train station is still there. Obviously no longer operating, but on the north end of town, there's a propane company, and then there's a railroad, it's like Ro Lone Pine Railroad Station Road or something. And if you drive out there, it's actually a private residence, but it looks just like that, minus the train, of course. Um, I don't know if they appreciate me telling people to go drive around their house, but it's pretty amazing. Um, so from Lone Pine, people then got on buses because the train track did not run as far as Manzanar. And if you know about the history of Manzanar, it was actually a pre-war farming town. There had been a town of Manzanar, which was bought out by an entity that collects a lot of water south of us, um, known as Los Angeles. <laughs> um, so, so they're going to the abandoned town site of Manzanar, which was set up, the army picked it as a camp. And you can see there's people young, old, um, and this is, you know, they have military police guarding the people. And some people say, even today, this happened for their own good. And what most Japanese Americans I know will say in response to that is, then why were the machine guns pointed at us? Why, when we got on the trains and the buses, did the soldiers have bayonets? And I think one of the stories that is, to me, most difficult to get my head around is, um, you know, Manzanar had an orphanage. It was the only one of these 10 camps that had an orphanage. It was called the Children's Village. And it was home to 101 children of Japanese ancestry, including some who didn't know they were of Japanese ancestry, like uh, the kids that were in Caucasian foster homes or kids that you know, did not have Japanese names. Um, there was one kid, Dennis Tojo, who did not, despite the last name, he didn't know he was half Japanese because he you know, was in an orphanage. Um, and so there's the story of the, the children coming from one of the orphanages in Los Angeles and all these little kids are on the bus and in the front of the bus there is a soldier you know, with a gun and a bayonet and you have these three, four, five year olds. And the woman who was the mother of the children's village, um, the assistant director, her name was Lillian Matsumoto and she died just a few years ago, well over 100 years old. And she said to keep the children occupied and busy, they had like this little talent show at the front of the bus. And the kids were taking turns telling jokes and stories. And she said one little girl who was like, I think she said four years old, got up at the front of the bus. And this is the innocence of children, right? The kid, the, the little girl starts singing, God bless America. And Lillian remembered that soldier had tears rolling off his cheeks as he's standing there holding his gun and bayonet. Um, so that, you know, you can, um, see this is the, the thing is that people started arriving, they were still building the camp. For the first people who got there, um, you know, the army brought in a contractor that brought in uh, 600 workmen to work 1,200, uh, excuse me, 12, probably felt like 1,200, 12 hours a day to build 700 buildings as fast as they could. So as people get off there, as they get up there, they're stepping off the bus into this massive construction zone. Um, and some people don't have roofs or windows or doors in their barracks. I mean, they're just coming into this. The, the sewer lines are open. Um, it was not quite ready for, uh, to be habited, inhabited. Um, this is some of the early arrivals, and you can see the amount of dust, because 
Manzanar had been a farming town, so this is actually, these people are lucky because they live up where the orchard trees were. There are other people where they were down in the other, part of this, other parts of the site where it was just dust and dirt. And since they had just bulldozed all the vegetation off, it was just this big dust bowl. And you can see people carrying their stuff in. Uh, this guy is actually from Bainbridge Island, Washington. There's a whole community from Bainbridge Island that came down to Manzanar because none of the camps in the Northwest were ready yet. Um, and they were the first uh, group taken from their communities and brought to Manzanar. Terminal Island in Los Angeles, they were the first people kicked out of their homes. Um, the Navy, where are the Navy people in here? Because, okay, is there a back exit? <laughs> the Navy originally told people in Terminal Island that they would have like a month, you know, to get their affairs together. They went in and they arrested all the men, about 600 men. And then they said, you know, you'll have, uh, I think it was four, three or four weeks to get together, you know, get your stuff together to leave. And then they changed, they changed it to 48 hours. And so there was no camp yet ready to take them. And so basically the Navy said, get off the island. And so you have people living in garages and under bridges and in, you know, hostels. And I mean, it was a disaster. Um, so Bainbridge Island is actually, so the Terminal Islanders get kicked out first, but the Bainbridge Islanders are the first people removed by the government, that the government gave the so-called courtesy of actually busing them down to Manzanar. This is a guy um, named Mr. Takemoto, and his uh, sons now are about 20 years older than he is in the picture. Uh, but you can see the barracks are pretty basic. Um, he made himself this rocking chair, and we actually have a reproduction of it in the exhibit. And then, of course, there's his wife and his little girl. And if you look at the picture, you know, you could, some people, if you didn't know the age difference, you might think that he's actually the little girl's grandpa. The reason is because of the immigration laws, there were many Japanese men who immigrated over, but because of the anti-miscegenation laws, they couldn't really get married. And so a lot of times they would bring over picture brides, and sometimes those women would be 15, 20 years younger than them. So it's a very interesting dynamic. It's, it's not true of everybody, but many families, you have fathers becoming first time fathers at the same age that many other men are becoming grandfathers. And, and that plays out in some of the sociology of the camps and how things, the dynamics and families and stuff like that. Um, but that's another other program that I haven't done yet. Uh, this is the inside of one of the barracks. These barracks are, um, 20 feet wide, 100 feet long. Those of you who've been in the military may have seen something like it, just basic theater of operations. Um, at Manzanar, most of them were put into 20 by 25 apartments, and you would usually have eight cots in there. You'd be lucky if you had a family of eight, um, because then you'd have your own apartment, but it could very well be that, you know, you two would live with her, who would live with these two, and those two. I mean, it, you didn't always get a good mix, and oftentimes you might have an elderly couple living with a uh, couple who have a, a newborn baby or teenagers. It was just basically eight people to a barracks as people came in. Um, and you can see it's just plain, plain walls and then tar paper on the outside, no insulation. Um, yeah, this is a mess hall. Um, and we actually have a mess hall from Bishop Air Base at Manzanar that we restored um, and it's very similar. So if you go to Manzanar, make sure you go out and see Block 14 and see, see some of the other buildings, not just the visitor center. Um, they're eating their slop suey there. One of the things that people sometimes say is that these mess halls really impacted their family dynamics because they often weren't eating meals as families anymore. You're eating cafeteria meals for up to three years, eight months and that some people say it was sort of a breakdown of their family because their father was no longer sitting at the head of the table. They're, they're all running around with their fellow friends. Um, but there are some families who their parents made them get their food and go back to their apartment and eat together as a family because they didn't want to have this sort of you know, mass meal me mentality. Um, these are some of the kids from the children's village orphanage and um, they range from you know, the kids there ranged from uh, newborn to 19, month, 19 years old. And uh, this is an early picture of school. You know, I mentioned Martha donating her papers. One of the new exhibits that we're working on, and in fact, I'm gonna be working on 
with a colleague finishing the panels this week and getting them into production is a whole exhibit called Dust of Diplomas and it's a permanent exhibit about schools in Manzanar and Martha is featured in there and her photos are featured in there. But you know, she came up about the time when things looked like this. These are kids studying their lessons. When the army started moving people, they didn't really think ahead about things like, gosh, you gotta have schools if you're gonna have 2,700 kids in there running around. Things like with the hospital and the medical care, when they supplied the hospital, what does the army usually supply for? Right? It's combat injuries. They had tons of bandages and all these other things. They didn't have OBGYN supplies. They didn't have things for elderly people. It was, it was all army. You know, so was, they did a good job of getting people into the camp, but not necessarily thinking through how is this all going to work because it was a new kind of thing. Um, this is a little bit later after the school is set up. Um, this is one of the preschool classes. You know, about two thirds of the people in that camp were 18 and under. Lots and lots of kids. Um, like I said, that's why there were 2,700 kids in the schools. This is a very famous Ansel Adams photo. And uh, this is the, you know, what is the historic entrance to Manson. We call it the historic entrance, but it's actually the historic exit because this wasn't built when most people entered. Um, but these, uh, if, when you drive past Manzanar today, these posts and chains, um, this is the 1943 photo, but in real life, those posts and chains and the rock garden under are still there. And we have a reproduction sign. And then the sentry posts are still there. We just don't have all the other buildings. Um, we do have, in our museum collection, we have the part that says Manzanar um, of the original sign because a guy named Mike Suzuki stole it in 1948. Well, he didn't really steal it. It was just there abandoned. And so he brought it back and said, do you guys want this? Um, so we have a... But we have a sign like that today. So, you know, history obviously is not always easy to understand. That's probably an understatement. Um, and in many cases, it's not easy to face. If you have lived here, if you lived here 20 or 30 years ago, um, and I don't know if you, any of you subscribe to the NEO register, but you know, the, the establishment of Manzanar was hugely controversial. Um, I've only been there 16 and a half years, but I know you know, especially like in the decade before I was there, there were a lot of people who were dead set against it because they said, we don't want a monument to the Japanese. And there are still people who think that somehow this was a Japanese POW camp or Japanese combatants or, you know, it's like, no, these are Americans. You know, if, because of the immigration laws, if the person who came to Manzanar was off the last boat from Japan in 1924, when they stopped immigration, that person would have been 18 years old by the time the war you know, came around. Um, so anyway, it was very controversial. Um, and I have to really salute Ridgecrest because one of the first, um, I think, things that locals really got behind was um, the, um, oh, I'm gonna mess up the name, but it's the, the Blue Star, it was the, the Garden Club of the Indian Wells Valley. Is that the right name? The Oasis, that's right, Oasis Garden Club um, actually partnered with a number of Japanese Americans to put the Blue Star Highway sign at Manzanar because there were 175 men and women who served out of Manzanar. Uh, most of them drafted, some of them volunteered, but it is a site. Um, and I think I've always thought very highly of Ridgecrest besides the fact that you have like big stores and, and movie nights and popcorn tomorrow night. But the idea that, you know, Ridgecrest was one of the communities that step, step, stepped forward and said, we want to help and we want to partner with you on telling this history. So uh, was anybody involved in, in that group or that movement? You're probably all too young, but um, it was done, I think in 98, something like that. But thank you, Ridgecrest. I guess I should say Indian Wells Valley, huh? Um, this is the plaque that was put there in 1973. Very controversial, the plaque is still there, but um, you can see it's got bullet marks and hatchet marks. And the first time I ever saw it when I was in the eighth grade, I remember the stench of urine um, because people used to vandalize it. I don't think that happens so much anymore. Um, but one of the things that was very controversial is it talks about it as a concentration camp. And this is 19, it was actually written in 1972. Of course, there's a lot of discussion today about what it should be called. And I'm not even gonna try to get into, you know, I don't have an opinion. I just want people to understand what happened there. Um, because, but there are, you know, if you think about it, it did concentrate people. 
but many people think of concentration camp as being the German camps and the death camps and the torture camps. But um, that really uh, frustrated a lot of locals that it said concentration camp because they didn't feel it was that. Uh, many of them just called it the Jap camp. And, um, but the proper name was Manzanar War Relocation Center. But a lot of Japanese Americans feels like, feel like that makes it sound like, it's kind of like Owens Valley Reception Center. It sounds like, you know, Club Med. Um, so history is about real people. Uh, these two folks, the, ha, any of you seen this picture before? I know Liz has, but have you, have you seen this? This is from Bainbridge Island, Washington. That's a woman named Fumiko Hayashida. She visited Manzanar for the first time after the war in April 2011. She was 100 years old. And as I mentioned at the program that Liz was at this fall, and Carol, Carol right? Is that right? Um, so we, she, we knew she was coming back and she was bringing her baby, who's 70 something. Um, and we all were, you know, she, she drove up in a van and we were all excited to meet her because if you're a history nerd at Manzanar and you, you know, you see people in these historic photos, it's pretty cool to meet them. And um, so she gets out of the van and, you know, we're all waiting to see what she's gonna say. And she gets out with her walker and she looks up and she sees the mountains and she says, I'm home. And I thought, huh? <laughs> home? Well, what? Why would you call this home? I mean, it had eight guard towers and a five strand barbed wire fence and guns pointing at you. How could you call this home? And then I thought about it, right? Remember what I said in October, thinking about, you know, she had a baby there. She raised her children, you know, at least for the first couple years of their lives there. Um, and I never really thought about Manzanar being people's home, but it was. Um, so, you know, one of the things that we try to do is obviously help people preserve their past. And, you know, like my weekend this weekend, part of why I got so tired is we are so excited to work with and to see folks um, and, and we have done that, you know, from the beginning, working very closely and collaborating with people who were in Manzanar, either as staff like Martha um, or as incarcerees. And so we really try to work closely with them to preserve their own history, you know, and, and preserve that for the sake of the future because there will come a time when there's not anybody who has firsthand experience. You know, just like our beloved Martha, she's not here to speak, but her photos speak, her oral history speaks, she's in our movie. She has an immortality that I think most of us don't ever experience because you can still go there and hear her voice every day. She's still, I don't wanna say she's still alive at Manzanar, but I think in spirit, she still is. Um, this is a tag from a guy named Hikoji Takeuchi. Um, when he first arrived at Manzanar, uh, he came on May 9th, 1942, with a group from Little Tokyo. He was assigned to Block 20, and um, because his apartment, you know, basically had no furniture, um, he lived with his mom and his kid sister, and he had promised his father on his deathbed, just a couple years before, that he would take care of his mom. And so he uh, went out to get, um, well, there was a scrap pile of wood, um, and he asked an MP, if he could go to the pile of wood and pick up some wood to make a, a table. So he gets permission from this MP, he walks over to the wood pile, picks up the wood, and he turns around with his arm load of wood to see the MP. The same MP he had just talked to, he sees the guy lowering his rifle. And he says, what the hell are you doing? And he sh the MP shoots him. And um, obviously he lived, because this is him in later years, he picks himself up, he's bloody all over the place, um, and some people pick him up and drive him to the hospital. And it's very interesting because there, was, there were two investigations about his shooting. One was done by the War Relocation Authority, which is the civilian agency, they oversaw the camp, and they said he's telling the truth, that, you know, that this guy just shot him, because the guy said he was running away, but in fact, Hikoji was shot in the front. And generally, it's hard to get shot in the front when you're running away. Um, the military police, the soldier, like I said, said he was running away. So I knew that there had been a guy shot um, and didn't know his name and, um, or really much anything about him. I just knew that he was shot and lived. 
And it turns out that um, he had gone to Japan after the war. He was a beggar in the street. He came back to the United States in the 1950s. And I literally ran into him by chance while having lunch with a couple of former incarcerees. Um, I had asked, there's a woman named Sue Kunatomi Embry. Have any of you ever heard that name? She was behind getting Manzanar set up, uh, well, preserved to begin with, and she wrote the language on the plaque. And she was involved from Manzanar um, from 1969 until she passed away in 2006. And um, so her, I asked her once, I'm like, what do you know about that guy? And she said, my brother saw him in Japan after the war and he was a beggar in the street. So I thought, well, what are the chances of ever finding this guy? Because I don't even know, like, he's probably still in Japan. So we go, we're, we're working on the movie on the exhibits for Manzanar, we're having meetings in LA about you know, how we should do it and what's the best approach. So I had a very late lunch with her and a guy named Archie Miyatake, who is gonna come up a little later in the program. So we are going to lunch at this restaurant and Archie, Archie's father snuck a uh, film holder and camera lens into the camp and took secret photos in the beginning. He eventually got to open a studio, but he, um, he knew, he knows everybody. He's passed away, but he knew everybody. So Sue and I go in and we sit down in this Japanese restaurant, we order our tea, and then Archie stops and talks to this older man who was going out the door when we were going in. And he comes and Archie comes and sits down at the table and he says to Sue, he says, hey, Sue, that was Hiko. His name was Hikoji. And Sue turns to me, and this is like a year after we'd ever even talked about this guy, and she said, that's him. And I said, huh? She said, that's him, that's the one. He's the one that was shot. You better go after him. And you know, we don't like chase people down the street usually to talk to them. <laughs> you know, it just seems a little weird. And she said, you better go after him. And I was like, uh, okay. So Archie and I go down the street and he's already like half a block away. And Archie calls out, he goes, he go. And the guy turns around and uh, we catch up to him and Archie says to him, this is Elisa, she's from Manzanar. And when he said Manzanar, his face just dropped. I mean, the guy looked like he had seen a ghost. And I, being very cool and calm and professional said, Mr. Takeuchi, I would love to talk to you sometime. I always wanted to be, I'd love to know anything that would happen to you. Can I please talk to you sometime? And he was like, oh, maybe sometime. And I said, I'll still be here Monday. And uh, he just said, oh, and he walks away. Well, later I get a phone call while I'm still down there in Los Angeles. And he said, I will talk to you. And what happened was Archie told him, this is the greatest endorsement I've ever had in my life. Archie said, she's okay. So he agreed to talk to me because I was okay. Um, and so I did this six hour oral history interview with him. It was incredible. He had not told his children about the shooting. He had not spoken of it at all. And so we did this six hour interview. This is actually a picture of him when he came to be in our movie. He's, he's, um, he's one of the voices in our movie, as is Martha. Um, and it was amazing. At the end of the interview, he said, you have, this has helped me so much. You know, I just feel just sort of, it, he just let it go. And um, he, he just, I, one of the questions I asked him, well, I wanted to confirm that it was the same soldier that shot him. I'm like, like that it wasn't some mistake or some change of guard. And he said, no, it was the same guy. And I said, what would you say to him if you saw him today? The guy's name was uh, Private Edward Phillips. And he said, I would say, I feel sorry for you because you had to live all your life knowing what you did. Now, you think, why would, he, why would this soldier have shot him if he wasn't running away? I forgot to mention when the, when the War Relocation Authority did the investigation, there's a line in the investigation they talk about that the people in the Owens Valley, it says they have no love for the people in that camp, but they don't think it's right that this MP is going around bragging that he shot himself a Jap in the local bars. So apparently it was, you know, I don't know what happened to Phillips, but that's what he was doing. He was bragging about having shot him. Um, and it's interesting because he came to the grand opening in the visitor center and he signed the, you know, the visitor register 
the very next name to him was actually an MP in Manzanar. Not the one who shot him, but a different guy. And I thought, I wonder, as these two men in their 80s stood next to each other, if they could have had any inkling that both of them were there as young men. And, and the worlds that separated him, the MP and the man who was shot by the MP. Um, Hikoji passed away, actually he died uh, February 18th, so just a couple of years ago, I think 2016. Um, but I later saw his daughter, and um, she said that it changed his whole life. Speaking about it just changed his life, and he just let it go. And even his grandson said, like, he just was a different person after he talked about it. And I think all of us probably somewhere in our lives have something that is so difficult and so painful that you can't even think about talking about it. And here's someone, you know, who lived with that and found a, a what, an opportunity, not an opportunity, but he, he found it changed his heart to let it go. And that's not because of me, that's because he just had a chance to talk about it. I'm just the one that showed up and begged him to talk to me. Um, let's see. This is actually, um, we did these biographical, biographical booklets on folks. This is the one we did on him and it's all his words. But we have these on our website, we have 67 of them. Um, and there, there are some camp staff kids, you know, Caucasian kids who lived in Manzar. I think there's five or six of them. Um, the woman who was the head of the orphanage is in it. And then most of the people are former incarcerees. And this is actually, um, this young lady here is Sue Kunatomi Embry. Her graduation photo, I think, in Lincoln High School, 1939. And this little boy is Dennis Tojo, the kid who didn't know he was half Japanese. Obviously, history is not a single story. Um, one of the themes of our exhibit is one camp, 10,000 lives, one camp, 10,000 stories. Um, and we thought 10,000 sounded better than 11,070, but 11,070 is the number of people who went through the camp. Um, and of course, that doesn't count people like Martha, you know, the hundreds of people who worked there, the MPs. We we're just, just saying generally 10,000 people. Um, and this is a wall of names we have in the exhibit um, that has all the names. Uh, just a couple of examples of stories. I was talking about Archie Miyatake, the one who told me or told Hiko that I would be okay. That's him right there as a young man in Manzanar, along with his mom, Hiro, his dad, Toyo, their sister, Mini, um, his brother, Bobby, and his brother, Tabo. And then this is the uh, Maruki family. And I just wanted to give... Um, a couple of examples, uh, and it actually, this is my advertisement. I brought Manzanar brochures, which um, you guys are gonna have out there somewhere, and you'll see these couple of stories um, featured in the brochure, because we're always trying to show the range of history. You know, it's not a single story. Not, you know, people had common experiences, but not all the same experience. So just as a quick example, um, the Maruki family, the family that was on the upper left, this is the mom, her name was Koharu Maruki. Um, this is 1918 when she immigrated over to the United States. She was already married when she came here. Um, this is her 10 years later. So she aged a little bit, but having four kids, I guess, does that to you. Um, this is their family, her husband, and then their kids. This is uh, Ruby, Rosie, who's the baby. I just talked to her the other day. Um, their son, Kao, short for Kaoru, not cow like a bovine. Um, and this is their daughter, Grace. And Grace and Rosie are still alive. They live in Las Vegas, spend all their time at the casinos, and they are 96 and 91. But um, during the, the, before the war, they lived in Boyle Heights, not that far from where the Miyatakes lived, and I already introduced them. Um, so just, I just wanted to, as a quick snapshot, just look at the oldest, what happened to the oldest child in each family in Manzanar. Um, so that is Archie, born 1924 on the left, Ruby's five years older than him. Um, so in Manzanar, we're going to look at Ruby first. Um, by the time she got to the camp, she was married and she was pregnant. Um, and she was uh, very large during her pregnancy. There were, you know, in retrospect, her sisters now say, you know, she had, there was something wrong, but they didn't know at the time because they didn't have ultrasounds and stuff but they said they felt so sorry for her going on the train. She was so miserable and so, you know, just struggling with her pregnancy. And um, so what happens in Manzanar is she goes into labor in the camp hospital on August 15th, 1942. 
she hemorrhages to death. She did not know that she was gonna have twins, um, and they had planned, if they had a, a little girl, they were gonna name her Diane Sachiko. It was very common to have an Americanized name combined with a Japanese name. Um, but because they had two babies, they named one Diane and one Sachiko, and um, she bled to death, and then the two little babies were just really tiny, um, and they lived a few hours and died. And so her story, you know, ends in Manzanar, um, hers and the babies. And Rosie talks about how, you know, her mother never got over this, losing her oldest daughter, losing her in the hospital, um, bleeding to death. And it's not for lack of medical care, it's just, you know, there was a, um, I'm sure there's a lot of factors, but you know, it's kind of a trivia question. Remember Fumi Hayashida, the woman who was holding her baby? And that picture with the tag? She went into labor, same hospital, same doctor, same day, and she delivered a little boy named Leonard, um, who you know, went on to serve in Vietnam and survive that, and then has since passed away. Um, but she had her baby the same day and obviously survived. Um, so this is the Buddhist church in Manzanar. Now, not to be completely depressing, um, Archie has a different story. So this is him, and he's in high school in Manzanar, and you can see here he's you know, he's at one of the parties or dances, and you can see how excited he looks to be there with those girls. Uh, <laughs> and you can see they look pretty excited to be with him. Um, looks like she's playing with her cell phone. It looks, yeah, this is, a <laughs> she's going to do a selfie. That's a good, I never thought about that. I have no idea what she's got, but I don't think it's a cell phone. Um, so this is Archie, and then, he meets a girl from the San Fernando Valley who lived a uh, catacorner one block away. Her name is Takeko Maeda, um, and he falls head over heels for Take. And in fact, I just saw her this weekend. Um, and if I'd had more time, I would have put a this weekend picture of her um, in there. Archie passed away a year ago, uh, December 20th. But they fell in love. They married after the war. They waited until 1949 because, you know, a lot of people when they left camp, they didn't even have a house to go back to. Miyatakis did, and they took in like 25 other people. But it took a while to have the money and the time and the means to get married. But um, this is them in 1949. They honeymooned in Yosemite. They were total disgusting lovebirds um, through all the <laughs> years I knew. I mean, not like sloppy lovebirds, but, but just people who, you know, had a really solid, loving marriage um, and who just loved to be with each other. Now, this is Merritt Park in Manzanar. It's one block from the hospital where Ruby died. And so, you know, when you think of her dying in the hospital, that's a very different vibe than you get from them loving to come back. They love, love, love to come back to Manzanar because that's where they met and fell in love and courted. So it's, a, you know, it's the same place, very different meaning. Um, and this is one I took in 2006 up at Merritt Park. Um, they courted there. She, his, because he, his dad had a camera, um, he asked if he could take her picture in the beautiful garden. This is back in camp. And um, that was his come online is, you know, could we go to the park and I'll take your picture? And so they love going back to Merritt Park. Um, and this is them, their last visit to Manzanar uh, with their family. And this one actually, um, so that's my husband who's waiting home for me and thinking she won't be home till 2 a.m. because she never stops talking. But um, we went out with them to Felipe's in LA. Have you ever been to Felipe's downtown where they invented the French dip? It's heaven. Anyway, so we used to double date and um, so we, this is after they were living in a nursing home, but we went to Felipe's. And so Archie's asking me, you know, oh, how are things at Manzanar? And do you have visitors? And are people in, you know, all these things. And he says to me, he said, you know, I have some good memories of that place. I met my wife there. And just as he said that, this was, I had my cell phone. Just as he said, I have some good memories. I met my wife there. She leaned over to him and I got this picture. It was totally unplanned just romance over roast beef. Um, but it's one of my favorite pictures. Um, this is 2014. That's the same day they're telling us goodbye. This was at their nursing home in Boyle Heights. And just a few blocks away from there, there's a cemetery. And that's Archie, he's now buried, his ashes are buried there, but this is his parents' headstone, um, Toyo and Hiro. This is the amazing thing. The reason I'm showing this picture of the cemetery in Boyle Heights is right behind their headstone, there's another one. 
the Marukis. Ro Rosie and Grace's sister and the babies and her parents are within about four feet of where the Miyatakis were, right there. Those, those are two families from Manzanar. And I included this picture because I thought they're not only together forever in history, they are literally physically together forever. Except that Rosie blew that line because they decided to move the ashes of their family from this headstone uh, to the Nishihonganji Temple because the sisters at 91 and 96 feel like once they're gone, no one's going to go to the, that their kids and grandkids are not going to go to the cemetery and they want the ashes to be, you know, where people will be. So they moved, they moved the ashes, but they did not remove the headstone because the cemetery was going to charge her $750 to move it. So she said, I'll just leave it there. So I feel like I can still use it. Um, obviously, history is about real people. And uh, this is a woman named uh, Joyce Nakamura Okazaki. This is a photo that was taken of her by Ansel Adams. She grew up to become a teacher. Um, I just saw her on Saturday and she's retired, but she's still teaching. And her mother was a PE teacher in camp. Um, and she's actually been very helpful with creating our classroom exhibit. There's a guy named Hank Umamoto. Um, you know, talk about real people. He's as real as it comes. Um, this is him doing a tour at Manzanar, and he uh, later wrote a book called Manzanar to Mount Whitney, because when he was in Manzanar, he remembered seeing the car headlights go up the road to Mount Whitney, and he thought, if I ever get out of here, I'm going to go up that road, and I'm going to see what's there. And in his 60s, he climbed Mount Whitney for the first time. He climbed it multiple times in his 60s and 70s. Um, and you probably remember, Liz, that this, well, you don't know that this is the part that got me in trouble the last time I did this program. So this will be the family version. We won't use any four-letter words, but one of the funniest things about Hank is he's a little bit of a rebel. And so when he was in Manzanar, he's 14 years old, um, he sees a jeep, just got to Manzanar, he sees this jeep with two MPs go by. And he yells, F you! And provides the accompanying gesture and these MPs hear it, and they slam on the brakes, put the Jeep in reverse, get out, walk up to him, and say, what did you say? And I won't ask you to guess, but because I, I got in trouble last time for that, because um, someone actually called and complained about my program that, that I had alluded to the F word. So you're gonna have to erase that part. But anyway, um, he, he did not say the word again. When the MP said, what did you say? He said, no, 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 nothing. And he says, he's now 88 years old, 89, I think. And he says, you know, I still regret that to this day. I wish I had just said it again. And I said, Hank, if you had said it again, you probably would not be here. Um, a little rebel. This is, uh, you know, I talk about real people. These are uh, the last surviving Maruki sisters, Grace on the left, Rosie on the right. And anytime you go to Las Vegas and go to the California Hotel and Casino, I can assure you you'll find them at slot, or the slots. And you can tell them I sent you. Um, but this is the two of them uh, back in 1931. And I adore these women. They're just really wonderful friends. Um, this is the brochure that you too can take home a complimentary copy of. Um, and it tells their story. This is some of the original artwork. Um, and, and so we use original voices, but we also try to use original artwork. Um, and then we have, the, this is the backside, it's got the map. And there is a picture of Fumi and her daughter, Natalie. And this is uh, Rosie, the 91 year old. Um, she almost made the basket, but the only, so far the only uh, former incarcerate who's made the basket is my friend Frank Kikuchi, who's 93 and blind. And he visited last summer and uh, his daughter just said, it's this direction, dad. And he threw the ball and whoosh. And it was, it was awesome. Um, this is actually the Miyataki family again on their last visit. It's Archie and his two grandkids and his son-in-law and uh, daughter-in-law um, at Manzanar. So it's been really interesting to have people come back and bring their families back and be able to share their own history um, this is a group coming out of the latrine that we just reconstructed. Um, we don't yet have exhibits in it, but this is the men's latrine. Before we had the latrine, 
reconstruct it, we would just have people stand there on the toilets and say, you know, just imagine that this is a latrine. But actually now we have reconstructed it and people get a pretty good sense of what it was like by seeing this. And you know, it's funny, you don't think much of a bathroom exhibit. I never thought I would be excited to work on a bathroom exhibit. But of all of the things that people wanted to see at Manzanar, people who were in Manzanar, they said, you have to have a guard tower. Well, actually many of them wanted all eight of the towers back, but the locals weren't so keen on that. So the compromise so far has been one tower. Um, and, and they said, you have to have a latrine because no one will understand the humiliation until you can stand in there and see it. Now, a lot of times, especially um, usually guys who are in the military say, well, you know, I was in Nam and I used one just like that. But I think there is a difference of, you know, ages like in Manzanar where you have, you know, girls having their period for the first time in public and elderly people having to go in there and, you know, babies and children and everything. They were separated, men's and women's, but there are a lot of people who still remember this as a very, um, a very strong memory of indignity. And, and they really want people to know this is what we put up with. I told these girls, I, th I said, I think you're the only people who ever, ever smiled in a man's in our latrine. Because I said, can I take your picture? And they're like, yeah. Um, and when I showed that picture at the reunion, all the people who had been in man's in our were like, ugh, young people. Um, these are the troughs, the sink trough, and then the showers. It's interesting because they made the latrines to the army design. And so the shower heads are like way up there. You know, look at how tall these are compared to how tall most Japanese Americans were, are, especially kids. I mean, those, the shower heads are about at my chin level. Uh, this is a Merritt Park today, Archie and Take's courting spot. And uh, that's what it looked like during the war. That's an Ansel Adams photo. Martha remembered this garden. And that's a combination of the rocks, right side today, left side, what it was like. And I think that's really what the site does and what our efforts try to do is to, you know, preserve the site today, but also to remember what it was then. Um, one of the most incredible programs we have is our oral history program. We've done about 570 interviews, and that includes camp staff. That includes Martha Schof. Um, she's one of those 500 interviews. This woman was one of the most incredible interviews we did, and she just passed away about three weeks ago. Her name is Hasai Jini Obana. She was raised over in um, Oxnard, and her dad wanted to get enough money to save to go back to Japan and build a nice house. Because you know, a lot of times people immigrate not to stay forever, but because they, you know, they think I'll make some money, I'll go back home. But then they have kids, and then the kids don't want to leave, and then the kids are Americans, and there's all kinds of ways that things change. But she, her family went back to Hiroshima in the late 1930s and her dad was gonna build his house and then he died of cancer. And then the family did not have the means to come back to the States. So during the bombing of Hiroshima, she was working in an office building about a mile and a half from the epicenter. Other people in that building died instantly. There were people who were impaled, people who were crushed. Um, she was severely injured, but obviously survived. And it was very interesting because it's the first time that we've done an uh, oral history interviewer with a Hiroshima survivor or Nagasaki or you know any of that. And um, we only knew her because her great niece was interning at Manzanar and she never even told us, like if I had a family member of some historic significance, you know, big mouth me, I'd be like, hey everybody. But she didn't tell us until one night we were at um, the ranger there, it was at her bridal um, or her bachelorette party uh, this intern, Katie, said, oh yeah, you know, my great aunt was at Hiroshima, and we all, like, the party just came to a screeching halt, and we were like, what? And, and so we said, would she be willing to talk to us? And so we did this interview, and it was very interesting because Jeannie said um, that she never thought, and the doctors never thought she would live to be maybe more than a year or two beyond Hiroshima, because they didn't know all the effects. Um, and so she always in her mind thought, I'm gonna die soon. And then, you know, she gets married, she has her first child, and she said there were like 20 something doctors in the room because everybody wanted to see what's, you know, what's this gonna be, what's gonna happen with this woman who's a, you know, survived radiation, what, what's gonna, what's she gonna give birth to? And she had, I think, three kids, all healthy. She still thought she was gonna die, and she was tracked throughout her life by the, um, 
the atomic, I can't remember the whole name, but it basically the atomic bomb survivors medical you know, tracking. Um, and she outlived most of the people tracking her because she just died at, I think she was 94. Um, yeah, it's pretty amazing. We were really bummed to hear of her passing. At the same time, it was like, wow, 94 is a pretty good run. Um, we also have, of course, artifacts in our museum collection. And while you're online checking out Martha Schoff's collection, um, Google Manzanar Virtual Museum. And you can see a bunch of these artifacts. It's a little fire helmet, kendo. Um, this is a Blue Star banner that, uh, I know, being a military town, you all know Blue Star banners. And um, that one hung in the window of the Munamori family. Their son, Sadao Munamori, well, the dad had already passed away, but her son, Sadao Munamori, uh, was fighting with the 442nd Regimental Combat Team in Italy. And um, she hung this in her barracks window. And in April 1945, right before the war was over in Europe, um, a German threw a grenade and Sadao, to save his men, threw his body on the grenade. Of course, he was killed instantly. Um, and he was the only Japanese American during the World War II era, during the 1940s, to receive uh, the, Congre the Medal of Honor. Um, but this Blue Star banner, uh, his sister, Sadao's sister, around 2000, donated it to us. She sent it in a box and she said, this hung in our barracks. The day they brought the telegram down, my mom br brought the telegram to us, my mom took it down. She folded it, put it in the cigar box, and his sister said, I don't ever want to see it again. So in National Park Service, you can have it, I just don't ever want to see it again. Um, and so we actually display it in our visitor center, and it hopefully introduces people to the idea of you know, Blue Star banners. Do they still do that as much? Do people display banners like that? I know they still have them, Gold Star Mothers, but I don't often see them. Um, you, I'm sorry, what? Yeah, I know they still have them. Um, just bringing it up to current times, this is the annual Man's in Our Pilgrimage this last year. Um, that is every year on the last Saturday of April. Be awesome if you guys wanna bring a group up. You'll be with about 2,000 other people, but it's the one time of year when people who are in Man's in Our come back. Um, there are cultural performances, there's an interfaith service. Um, it's an amazing experience. And these are the taiko drummers. And if you've never heard taiko drumming, um, you can like literally feel it, feel it in your heart in every sense of the word. Um, this is the part of the religious service. They always have Christian, Buddhist, and Shinto ministers uh, who pray for the souls of the dead there. Um, and it's really beautiful. And these are this last year, um, took this picture and, and their, their signs say, love by any means necessary, solidarity by any means necessary. And the lady in the center is Muslim and it's very interesting because after September 11th, one of the first communities to stand up with Muslim Americans were Japanese Americans because they said, hey, we've been here. You know, we know what it's like to be blamed for something you didn't do, but people who look like you did. And so it's, it's very interesting to me. One of the um, women that I know, um, you know, I don't really consider her an activist, but after September 11th, she went out with Muslim women to the grocery store to help them be safe. Because she said, you can't do that. You know, we can't let this happen in our country. We can't let this happen to other people. Um, we do have a, a junior ranger activity booklet and actually, um, when Fumi Hayashida visited at age 100, I gave her a badge, but everyone else has to do a booklet. So we do have a lot of kids who come and they learn about Manzanar. So this is one of the activities I love. They draw their own gardens at Manzanar. Um, but it's interesting because, you know, even really young kids get it. Sometimes the young kids think, well, you know, it's a bummer that they couldn't take their dog, but you'd be amazed the kind of insights that even children have. Um, we do have a virtual tour on our YouTube channel. It's, uh, the YouTube channel is Manzanar NPS, as in National Park Service. So if you don't have enough Manzanar tonight, you can race home and watch it on your iPads. Um, we also do some other exhibits. This is one on the Button family of Lone Pine. They are um, a Paiute Shoshone family. And you know, Manzanar, of course, is a Paiute homeland. 
Um, and so the uh, matriarch of the family, Irene Button, right here, um, she came to us and she offered to donate her artifacts and share her story because uh, she was concerned what might happen beyond her lifetime to her stuff because like the baskets and stuff are really valuable financially. Um, but she, she herself and her family recognized, you know, that there's even a greater value to the history, not just the collector value. Um, we do have exhibits that we're putting out on site. This is actually a photo taken at Manzanar in the late 1800s. Um, this is the town of Manzanar. Um, we all have exhibits about the water wars. I mean, you think about Manzanar as this little square mile, but it's really a microcosm of American history where you have, you know, the Native Americans and the water wars and all these other themes, not even talking about Japanese Americans. It's an amazing little piece of history there. Um, I think probably if you slept through the whole program, the, the next couple slides are the most important ones. And one is that Manzanar can change people's lives. We have these comment books and people have commented for the last 14 years. Um, and I just like this uh, cartoon, but this is my favorite one of anything anyone ever wrote in a comment book. And it says, um, October 30th, 2015. I have been prejudiced all my life against Japanese, 75 years. As of today, that is gone. I'm so ashamed, I cry as I write this. Thank you. And this gentleman actually signed his name and put his address, which is way more brave than I would have been. Um, we've also had other people like General DeWitt's granddaughter. Um, General DeWitt was the head of the Western Defense Command during World War II, and he's really the guy who pushed for this and oversaw it. We had, um, in one of these comment books, a woman write, General DeWitt was my grandfather. I had no idea. Um, and so, and, and of course, a lot of people who were in Manzanar write about it. So um, I hope if you have a chance, you come visit Manzanar, look me up. Um, and, uh, you know, hopefully, um, I, well, first of all, I also want to say, I really respect and appreciate all the work you do to preserve history and to share history. And I appreciate you being here tonight to learn a little bit about the history up the road. So um, thank you very much. And I'd be happy to answer questions if you have any. Thank you. Yes. No, he wasn't. So um, there were other people who were shot during the, what is called the Manzanar riot, um, which actually wasn't a riot, but a demonstration that, um, it, that's a whole other program, but basically um, there were a bunch of soldiers lined up, the MPs lined up, and the crowd surged forward. And it's, a, a colleague of mine with a PhD in history explains it more accurately, but basically the MP shot into the crowd um, killed two people, others had injuries, you know, most of them from the gunshots, but also from tear gas and stuff. So um, depending on how you count it, I think it's 10 or 11 actually shot, two died, and then others survived. Yes? Did they tap into the aqueduct to supply water to those people? Well, the, a the aqueduct is uh, east of Manzanar. So what, what was used to supply the water was uh, the Shepherd Creek that comes down and ultimately goes into the aqueduct, but it was intercepted and they built a 950,000 gallon reservoir. First it was 550,000 and then they expanded it to 950,000. So that, the water otherwise would have gone in the aqueduct, but it, came, it didn't come from the aqueduct. And Los Angeles was not very happy. You know, they owned the land at Manzanar because they'd bought the town out in 1924 and they were not happy about the camp. And the government basically condemned it for the duration of the war. And one of the things I love, and I don't know if this is an urban legend or something I made up or something I read, but I understand that there was a dispute between the city of Los Angeles and the federal government, right? The two most popular entities in the valley. There was a dispute over how the water at Manzanar was gonna be um, paid, rated. And the government, the federal government said it's industrial and Los Angeles tried to say it was residential. So there was this dispute over the water bill and my understanding, which I haven't researched, is that the federal government might have stiffed Los Angeles for the water bill, which is kind of, most of us in the Valley take great satisfaction, but um, yeah. Any other, yes? I have a, uh, did you know that one of the barracks at Van Orico? 
Yes, yes. So there were uh, 504 barracks at Manzanar plus the hospital buildings and the administrative buildings. There's like 800 buildings there and they are all over the place. And I know there's the one in Trona. I think there could also be some in Ridgecrest. There's a guy who wrote a book called Architecture Double and he went out and tried to track down the Manzanar buildings and then show their current use. So like the, the Lone Pine budget in is Manzanar barracks. And because I have a sick sense of humor, there's a few times where former incarcerees have come up and like there's no other motels to put them up in. I'm like, um, I hate to tell you, but do you mind staying in a barracks again? But it kind of looks like a super eight inside now. Um, but they're all over the place. The only trouble was when the guy wrote the book, he took anything that looked, at those, that looked like those dimensions and said, oh, it's gotta be Manzanar. Um, and of course, like down here, I'm sure there's probably buildings off the base that look like that too. But there are motels, the Boy Scout Hall and Bishop is a Manzanar barracks. There's some of the administrative barracks in Lone Pine. In fact, one of them on Hay Street still has the original doors and windows. It's like a time capsule. And I would love to get that, you know, see that come back to Manzanar. Um, and yeah, church social halls, but I knew the four square church was, and Martha always made sure we knew that too. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of, I don't have great vision, so you have to, yeah, up against the wall. Well, what happened, my understanding, well, I know that they definitely got off the trains in Lone Pine to go to Manzanar, but the narrow gauge continues and it goes up to Oweno and Kearsarge and, you know, goes up to somewhere in Nevada, or did, right? Yeah, Laws. You know, there was a fire in Bishop just the other day and it was heading towards Laws, but they got it out, fortunately, so all is well. Um, but they, they came up on the Southern Pacific, so they didn't go on to the narrow gauge railroad. They just got people off and took them on buses. Actually, if you're, if you're a train nerd, um, in Independence now, the old um, Slim Princess engine 18, there's one, I think number nine is at Laws, but number 18 is in Independence. I might have messed that up, but. They just moved it to Eastern California Museum, but they actually took it up to Laws on a truck and ran it back and forth for Laws Day. So they got that engine running and it actually runs. Unfortunately, you can't like drive it down the street because it's a train, but it's pretty cool and it's at the Eastern California Museum. So anybody else? Um, I'm gonna hang around for a few minutes and then I'm gonna, I still have to drive home tonight, but um, just really wanna thank you very much for your patience in waiting six years for me um, and <laughs> your patience in waiting uh, an hour and like 17 minutes for me to talk, but thank you very much.